Let's start by clearing up a common fallacy about evolution, that Darwinism and evolutionism are the same thing. They are not. Evolutionism is the simple doctrine that life on Earth has a history. This doctrine accepts that life in the past was not like life in the present, and life in the present will not be what life is like in the future. These days, that's a pretty uncontroversial idea. I'm an evolutionist, for example, which puts me pretty much in the mainstream. I'm not a Darwinist, though, which puts me into the realm of the heterodox. Why? Well, here's why. Darwinism so dominates our thinking about evolution today that it is easy to equate evolutionism with Darwinism. That is to say, evolutionism is Darwinism and Darwinism is evolutionism. That's not correct, though. They're not even the same thing. Evolutionism is a statement that life has a history. Darwinism seeks to explain how that history came to be. Conflating the two opens up a lot of problems. For one thing, it's pretty much agreed that life has evolved. It's not entirely clear, however, what Darwinism actually is. Over the decades, it's meant many things. Darwinism 1.0, 2.0, and so forth. When you conflate a certainty, evolutionism, with an uncertainty, which Darwinism are we talking about, you will only create a muddle. And we'll be delving into this in subsequent lectures. For another thing, there have been over the years many ideas about how evolution works and what drives it. We have one form of Darwinism, let's say Darwinism 1, but there are alternative mechanisms, let's say M1, M2, and so forth. So, which mechanism? We could dismiss these alternatives if Darwinism had falsified them, but Darwinism has not done so. The bottom line? The Darwinian idea is not the only kid on the evolutionism block, so to speak, and we'll be getting into this problem later as well. As we do so, we're going to have to confront another thing about evolutionism. It's not just a scientific issue, it's a deeply philosophical one as well. In addition to its scientific claims, Darwinism makes some pretty bold philosophical claims, and we'll need to unpack those claims as well. Let's start with creation myths. Nearly every culture has a creation myth, whether those cultures are European, Middle Eastern, Islamic, or Asian. What's that, you might be saying? What do creation myths have to do with evolution? Doesn't the one disprove the other, or the others? Well, not quite. What these have to do with evolution is that they also claim to be historical accounts of nature. In nearly every creation myth, the Earth and everything on it has a beginning, sometime in the distant past, sometime recently. In some cultures, like Judaism or Christianity, nature also has a definite end. Creation has a history, and they are, in their own ways, evolutionary stories. And evolution? Well, here's what's likely to be a controversial statement. Evolutionism is, in its own way, a creation story. What interests us here is that creation myths have, at their hearts, some kind of agency driving that history. There's some agent, some godlike supernatural being, that brings the universe, the earth, and all its living inhabitants into being from nothing. In many cultures, this supernatural agency even governs day-to-day -day life. The Greek pantheon, for example, consists of hordes of minor gods and semi-deities that take an active role in shaping the course of history, even down to meddling in people's day-to-day -day affairs sometimes with whimsical intent, and sometimes malevolent intent. We don't normally think about these creation myths in this way, but these agency-based stories are evolutionary stories. Evolution is concerned with historical questions. Creation myths and theologies are as well. We might quibble and argue about whether these are scientific theories, but science itself really is a fairly late development in human culture, so judging creation myths by that standard isn't really fair. I bring it up not to disprove or validate these myths, but because the concept of agency is an important issue in evolutionary thought. 
Specifically, the Darwinian idea seeks to remove agency from the evolutionary process. Is that a legitimate aim? We'll get more deeply into that later as well. The attitude toward creation myths changed dramatically about the 6th century BC, with the rise of Greek civilization in the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm going to focus on the Greeks here, not to ignore other cultures, but because Western civilization has its roots in Greece, and evolutionism is very much a product of Western civilization. So that's where we'll look. What arose in the 6th century BC was philosophy. That's a little unfair to put it that way. Philosophy is concerned with the nature of nature, so to speak, and by this criterion, creation myths and theologies are a sort of philosophy. What made the 6th century philosophers different was their belief that people could use reason to thinking through the nature of nature independently of the myths. These thinkers, known collectively as the pre-Socratic philosophers, had different and diverse takes on the fundamental question of agency. For example, one common theme for these philosophers was a fundamental tension between opposing forces. These forces could move nature, and they were, essentially, agency. The opposing forces could be described as love and hate. Love brought things together, hate pushed them apart. Other, more neutral terms could be used, like attraction and repulsion. In this conception, all the order of the universe from the tiniest atom to human civilization was driven by the interplay between attraction and repulsion. Most important, attraction and repulsion were properties of the universe that were independent of the gods. The gods could take advantage of them, but they did not make them. Furthermore, man could uncover and understand these rules through reason, and this gave man a new tool to use against the whims of the gods. Out of this new understanding came the fundamental concept of flux. Everything flows, as one of these philosophers Heraclitus put it. This poses a fundamental question about the nature of the universe. Is the universe is, or does the universe become? If the universe simply exists, the universe is a noun. If the universe becomes, the universe is a verb. Heraclitus put it best. He said that no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. The river and the man might appear to be the same at different times, but they are not. Behind the appearance is something deeper. If the universe is flux, the universe is a verb. It's a process. This is how the universe can have a history. If the universe just is, that is, the universe is a noun, the universe cannot have history. It has an existence. The problem with the universe as noun idea was that anyone could see that change was all around. There was a past, there was a present, and one could look ahead to see the future coming into being. Seasons changed. Animals and people were born, lived, and died, and history was a matter of record. Yet one could not dismiss the universe as noun idea entirely. Certain things seemed constant. There was a sky, there was an earth, there was water and air, there were stars in the sky, whatever the stars were. Another group of pre-Socratic philosophers known as the atomists sought to resolve this tension between becoming and being. The most famous of the atomists was Democritus, who was a near contemporary of Socrates. Democritus is best known for his atomist conception of the universe. To the atomists, the universe was both being and becoming. But most radically, the atomists rejected agency. The problem the atomists had to confront was how to get becoming without agency. To the atomists, the answer laid in the diverse forms of matter that comprised the universe. To our senses, there seem to be a lot of different forms of matter, such as wood, stones, people, the rich diversity of matter we perceive is the result of the association of a small number of different types of indivisible particles, which Democritus termed atoms. 
These atoms were not like our conception of atoms. We have a pretty good idea what atoms are. Democritus, on the other hand, had to speculate, so we will too. Let's represent four forms of atoms with a pentagon, a hexagon, an octagon, and a triangle. These could associate in different combinations to form different types of matter. Matter was therefore determined by the rules of association between the different types of atoms. So let's just set a rule. Atoms associate with other like atoms. Pentagons would be drawn to other pentagons, triangles to triangles, and so forth. Other forms would be repelled from one another. Again, we'll just set a rule. Pentagons and hexagons would repel one another. Octagons would repel pentagons, and so forth. Set a random system of these atoms into motion, and out of these rules of association would emerge a larger scale order. These assemblages of atoms could dissociate, but the rules of association would always bring them back together. In this way, being and becoming could be reconciled. The being part was to be found in the indivisible and unchanging nature of the atoms. The becoming part was to be found in the ongoing association and dissociation of the different types of atoms. Thus, one could get both flux, becoming, and existence, being. Let's come back now to evolution. It's all well and good to speak of rivers, or weather, or matter as fluxes of atoms, but what about living things? Here, the most significant question to be asked was whether life stood out from the rest of the universe as something unique. We'll be getting into that question in the next lecture. After that, the next most significant question concerned the nature of life itself. Why were there worms, plants, birds that flew in the sky, butterflies, things that crawled on the ground? Were humans different from other mammals, and how did these differences come to be? You get the drift. Anaxagoras, a contemporary and disciple of Democritus, thought he had a solution, and like Democritus, his solution was atomist. The game of Mr. Potato Head gives us a good analogy for explaining his idea. To Anaxagoras, living things were made up of indivisible parts, living atoms of a sort. There existed a diverse array of these parts. Keeping with the Mr. Potato Head theme, there could be potato bodies, but also avocado bodies, tomato bodies, pepper bodies. These bodies could be paired with arms, eyes, ears, mouths, tongues, noses, mustaches, and so forth. In the mind of Anaxagoras, these parts floated around in a kind of neverland, bobbing about as if in a kind of soup. A living thing came to be when these parts came together into different assemblages. Some of these associations would work, that is to say, arms, ears, mouth, all looked to be more or less in the right place. Two eyes between two ears, mouth in the right place, arms on either side. Other associations would not work, however. There would be an arm where a mouth should be, ears in the wrong place, no mouth, or a tongue next to the eyes. Those associations that worked would hold together and continue to exist. Those that didn't work would fall apart and cease to exist. I bring up Anaxagoras and his fantastical idea for two reasons. The first is as an example of how the atomists sought to explain something their contemporaries said the atomist idea could not possibly explain, life in all its different forms. We'll come back to this critique in the next lecture. The second reason I bring him up is that Anaxagoras has been proposed as some sort of an early Darwinian thinker. Survival of associations that work and the disappearance of things that don't work sounds a lot like natural selection, doesn't it? Well, maybe, but one can stretch an analogy too far. Making Anaxagoras into some kind of Ur-Darwin is just dressing him up in a costume that doesn't really fit, like the way we dress up our dogs in funny costumes. 
we must always keep in mind that the pre-Socratics, Anaxagoras included, were not looking to explain evolution. Evolution wasn't really even a thing back then. What the atomists really wanted to do, Anaxagoras included, was to abolish agency as a means of explaining nature. According to them, no agency was required to explain the universe. In other words, the creation myths were bunk. All one needed to explain the universe was an understanding of the rules of attraction and repulsion among the universe's constituents. In so doing, one could banish the gods from the affairs of men. One could say, in fact, that the atomists were the militant atheists of their day. And what does this mean for evolutionism? In a sense, Darwinism also seeks to abolish agency as a driver of the evolution of life on Earth. Does that make Darwinism the atomism of our day? From here we have to tread a bit carefully. Although one could say that the militant atheists of our own day find a congenial home in modern Darwinism, it's really a stretch to say that Darwinism is in itself an atheistic philosophy in the way atomism was. Assuming anyway that it is, is one of the reasons why evolution is a flashpoint in our ongoing culture wars. But equating Darwinism to atheism is dressing up Darwinism in a costume that doesn't really fit, just as the proto-Darwin costume doesn't really fit Anaxagoras. Even so, there are some deep issues in there to explore, which we'll also do in a later lecture. Before we get there, though, we want to turn to the principal critics of the atomists, the followers and disciples of Socrates. 